So again, it's my pleasure to welcome everybody to uh, our keynote webinar for December on brachial plexus, birth injuries, current treatments, and future directions. And I am very excited for uh, to have our speakers today, Dr. Andrea Bauer and Dr. Roger Cornwall. And it's my pleasure to uh, introduce both of them this morning. So Dr. Roger Cornwall graduated from Columbia University before doing fellowships in hand and upper extremity surgery at Harvard and at uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He completed visiting fe fellowships in pediatric orthopedic hand surgery and in uh, brachial plexus surgery. And he has founded the Hand and Upper Extremity Center at Cincinnati Children's. Both of our speakers today are uh, members of Plexus Nexus, which is another outstanding organization at brachial plexus space. And I think will be discussed um, a little bit more during the presentation. And also both of our speakers, not only are uh, clinicians, but do outstanding research. Our second speaker, uh, Dr. Andrea Bauer, who is an associate professor at Harvard Medical School, graduated from Columbia University and completed fellowships in pediatric hand surgery and also hand surgery at uh, Mass General Hospital. She specializes in pediatric hand, upper limb, and peripheral nerve surgery with special interest in brachial plexus birth injury. And her research focuses on early diagnosis of types of nerve injuries associated with birth, birth plexus injuries and also the goal to find treatments that can be applied to improve outcomes. Again, Dr. Bauer is also a member of, uh, of Plexus Nexus, and uh, we're excited to, to hear more about them today as well. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Bauer. All right, thank you so much. Let's see if I can share here. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us. I see some friends in the audience and I'm looking forward to a lively Q&A. Um, so we're going to tag team this. I will start with the current treatments, and then Dr. Cornwall will continue with future directions. So as probably most of you already know, brachial plexus birth injury happens in about one in a thousand live births. This is a traumatic injury at birth. Uh, it happens to large babies who undergo a difficult delivery. And there's a wide range of severity. We're told that 80% of children will spontaneously recur, but we all know that many don't. And there are surgeries that we offer, including nerve surgeries and secondary surgeries when spontaneous recovery is not enough. Just to focus a little bit on the psychosocial aspects of this, when you meet a new baby, what the parents hear is that they had a normal baby who was then injured at birth. We throw a lot of complicated terminology at them. There's an uncertain prognosis with any nerve injury. They get information from multiple and conflicting sources, and then the condition evolves as the nerves recover or don't and as the child grows. And we have multiple treatments that we can offer at different times throughout childhood, but with variable results. I like to contrast this because the other half of my practice is congenital upper limb differences. So I like to contrast brachial plexus injuries with transverse deficiency. And what parents tell their children or tell themselves is that this is how the child was made. They could have a, a very straightforward difference. If you're missing a hand, you're missing a hand. It's easy to understand and conceptualize that. Uh, there are lots of support. There are lots of visible role models in the area of congenital upper limb differences that we don't see as much in brachial plexus birth injury. So we're gonna start with the current recipe for treatment here. And this is just the list of the principles that we rely on starting with early physical and occupational therapy repeated careful clinical examination. We've learned over the last 20 years to pay attention to the shoulder. I'll take you through some of the innovations and in how we do excellent, technically excellent nerve surgery. Uh, and then later technically excellent secondary surgery. And we do have some clinician and patient reported outcomes that we can use to judge ourselves. Although I think Roger will talk more about how we're failing in that regard. So to start with the evaluation, um, the state of the art evaluation right now is this, is this active movement scale, which was developed in Toronto in the early 2000s. And this is because we can't ask a baby to perform certain physical exam moves on command, but we have to position them so that the arm is either working against gravity or, or gravity eliminated, and then entice them with toys or rattles or tickling them uh, to try to get the nerves to show what they can do. And what we're looking, if you look at the bottom right corner here, we're looking to see based on their active movement, is any particular nerve root in the brachial plexus an avulsion, a rupture, a neuroma that's recovering, a neuropraxia that's already recovered. And we're doing all of this by repeated serial physical exam. 
So based on those physical exams, who needs a nerve surgery? The test answer for anyone taking their orthopedic boards would be that the a child with a global palsy, we know that there's work that needs to be done. And so we might recommend going to the OR as soon as it's safe around three months of age, because we know that um, if there's multiple nerve root avulsions, if our exam is not showing um, that things are recovering over time, that there's going to be work for us to do. In the child who's showing some recovery over the first few months of life, particularly with an upper trunk injury, if they have failure of elbow flexion to return by about six months of age, we know that they would have a better outcome with nerve surgery than without. And then finally, some kids don't follow the textbook and may seem that they're starting to recover by six months of age, but then are not by nine months and fail the so-called cookie test, bringing a cookie to your mouth by bending your elbow and abducting your shoulder without bending your neck totally down. And so if you don't have enough combined shoulder and elbow function to pass the cookie test by nine months of age, then that's another indication for surgery. So these are kind of the standard of care right now for who needs a nerve surgery. And in terms of what we do, so um, you know, I showed here in, the, in this last slide, this is an example of sural nerve grafting. There's also in the last 20 years been a lot of improvement in terms of our understanding of nerve transfers. And these are just two papers applied to the um, infant literature, there's been many more since these, showing that we can use isolated nerve transfers, uh, both within the plexus and extraplexal to, um, to improve our, perhaps improve our nerve surgery outcomes. And things have gone really crazy in the area of uh, nerve transfers, even using the contralateral brachial plexus. You can see here um, schematics from uh, Xu Fen Wang's original paper on this. Again, there have been additional papers and techniques that have been described, but this is taking the normal contralateral C7 nerve from the other side and transferring it across the neck um, to the infected break to the affected brachial plexus. And so, I would submit that you know over the last 20 years, we've really pushed the limits of where we can bring nerves and what we can do with nerves to try to improve outcomes for children. We all know that along the same time frame that we're having to make these make these decisions about whether the nerves are recovering, we also have to worry about the shoulder. And so this was the initial study in the early 2000s out of Texas Scottish Rite showing that as early as two months of age, you could, de you could detect glenohumeral dysplasia in children with brachial plexus birth injury. So as their nerves are still recovering, the shoulder joint is already being affected and the development of the shoulder and the shape of the shoulder is already being affected by this nerve injury. My work at the Shriners Hospital um, a little bit after that, we showed that this was very common. So in our brachial plexus clinic, 29% um, of infants who were presenting to the brachial plexus clinic had glenohumeral dislocation that we could see on ultrasound. And we recommended that any child who has passive external rotation of less than 60 degrees at the side should be screened for ultrasound because they had a high, high risk of having a glenohumeral dysplasia that was evident on ultrasound. So this is an example of a child who's maybe barely passing the cookie test, but it's not because his nerves haven't recovered, it's because his shoulder joint is not in place. And maybe we can affect these by doing, um, by doing Botox early on in an infant to try to improve their shoulder um, position and balance around the shoulder so that later on um, when they're, uh, as their nerves have continued to recover, they're able to show the nerve recovery because the shoulder joint is now in place. So this is an example of a child who had Botox at seven months of age and now at age two, you can see here, excellent reach and use of her external rotation and her abduction, just having had that Botox at an early age. So if we understand what's going on with the shoulder at the early age, perhaps we can start to apply our treatments earlier. The next thing that I wanna talk about is the later treatments on the shoulder. So um, the arthroscopic release of the shoulder came about uh, early on in my training. This was popularized by Mike Pearl in Southern California. And his initial study had 19 children an average age of 1.5 years. And he showed that he could improve passive external rotation and even affect glenohumeral remodeling on subsequent MRI just by doing an arthroscopic release um, of the subscap and including Latin teres transfers in some older kids. And so this was kind of the first 
um, demonstration of the ability of the arthroscopic release uh, to improve the shoulder joint position. Uh, interestingly, in this initial study, he did have some loss of internal rotation, which we've seen in many of the treatments around the shoulder. This is an example of a child who might be indicated for that procedure. So this is a two-year-old girl, and you can see the affected side on the left of the screen. And here, if we draw a line down the center of the scapula, we can see that the majority of the head of the humerus is behind that line of the scapula. She doesn't have terrible glenoid retroversion. I would say this is a mild glenohumeral dysplasia, but someone where the shape of the shoulder joint is affecting her ability to move that shoulder. And so in my hands, this is an indication for an arthroscopic release and a lat anterior transfer. Use a 2.7 millimeter scope. You can see here the simulated view through the scope and how we would um, cut through partially the subscap. Here are some views from inside. So the humeral head is on the left. The subscap is here below the cannula. And this I learned from Roger to use the arthroscopic biter to get through the tendinous portion of the subscap and leave the muscle behind. And so uh, later on, uh, so for me at the same at the same setting later in the procedure, um, Latin teres transfer here, the Latin teres are tagged and then transfer to the rotator cuff. And this is not that same patient, but you can see here over 10-year follow-up that this arthroscopic release and uh, tendon transfer has the ability to actually reshape the shoulder joint over time, showing progressive improvements in gonohumeral alignment. Sometimes even bigger surgeries are needed. And uh, this is an example of a child who was older at the time of surgery, had more significant glenoid um, dysplasia. And we learned again from Toronto that perhaps we can acutely change the glenoid shape using an osteotomy um, of the glenoid to fast track that remodeling. Although you can see from the extent of the approach that is needed for this case, perhaps also leading to a lot of stiffness of the glenohumeral joint postoperatively. And finally, um, it's always important in orthopedics to not forget about salvage procedures. And so um, the humeral external rotation osteotomy has a 50 year track record of being able to improve external rotation uh, in this condition. Uh, personally, I like um, the medial approach that you can see on the x-ray here and that um, was popularized by Abzug and, and Kozin just to be a more um, cosmetic approach. And you can see lots of pictures of happy kids that we've been able to restore external rotation on using these various methods. So we're great, right? Um, brachial plexus solved. <laughs> so my favorite uh, Tom Brady and uh, Gronk. Um, well, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. And are we really being successful with our nerve treatment? So this is 20 years ago, but I would submit that our results are not that different. And this study out of the UK showed that um, good uh, percentage of good results after uh, repairs of the brachial plexus was fairly low, particularly as we get down into the more extended and global palsies. Uh, we looked at these results out of the Shriners Hospital, uh, 43 infants who underwent a brachial plexus reconstruction um, with an average of seven years of follow-up. And yeah, 91% recovered anti-gravity elbow flexion. But you can see that the numbers go down and, and the shoulder external rotation was only 19%. Wrist extension was only 37%. And the vast majority of them required secondary surgeries after these nerve reconstructions. And maybe all of these technical advances in terms of getting better nerve function, getting better external rotation are not even achieving our goals, um, or not even the correct goals that we should be achieving. So Roger and I showed this many years ago that um, these, these injuries are happening in context of families that are going through a very traumatic event. And, and we looked at the relationship between medical malpractice litigation, which in the US is kind of a marker of medical trauma, um, and the parent reports of patient function. And the, what we found was that the differences in parent reported patient function in families who were or were not undergoing litig litigation were larger differences than any changes that we'd seen following external rotation tendon transfer surgery. So all of those pictures of happy kids uh, are not the same as whether your parents decide to go through a lawsuit or not. Uh, we also know that there's lots of other medical issues that happen with these kids. And so we showed um, when I was at the Shrine that there is a high, very high rate of childhood obesity um, in our brachial plexus population, big 
babies turn into big kids and can have a lot of other health issues related to the obesity. Um, and this, um, this study also uh, showed that there's even a high prevalence of early language delay and that maybe there's some overlap between central nervous system and peripheral nervous system um, injuries. And this was in 2016, the first Naracus meeting that I ever attended where Dr. Jaber stood up and said, we all know that these children will never reach the socioeconomic status of their parents. Well, I didn't know that. Um, and so perhaps as we think about brachial plexus injury, it's time for a new recipe in terms of how we direct our treatments. And this is the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health through the WHO, where you can look at a health condition in the framework of not only the body function and structure, how does your shoulder move? How well can you bend your fingers? But also what activities do you use your arm in? What do you participate in? And what are the environmental and personal factors that come into play? Um, in your condition. And so if we look at brachial plexus birth injury, we talk, we spend a lot of time talking about nerve function, muscle function, and skeletal growth. And yeah, kids have difficulty with reach and overhead activities, but how does that affect their participation in school, sports and activities, and later em employment? And how is the environment in terms of public knowledge, role models, lots of different providers and litigation affect that issue? as well as the personal factors of the child who's dependent on their parents who have a lot of family stressors. And so maybe our initial recipe needs to be changed with um, improvements in public awareness, like the work that the GNF is doing, early education and prognosis, um, being honest about prognosis with our families, as well as improvements in the biology of nerve repair, a better understanding and perhaps treatment of contractures that could decrease our need for secondary surgeries, and better outcomes that show us what matter to our patients. And so with that, I'm going to hope that Dr. Cornwall will give us all the answers. Thank you, Andy, and, and thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, being on this webinar. I don't know that I'll give you answers, but I'll try to give you more questions. So um, so I have the, the fun part here um, where I get to talk um, I got get to talk about future directions. And so um, uh, this, uh, um, so I'll start with a couple of disclosures for some research funding, um, but most importantly, that I'll be discussing the off-label and experimental use of a couple of drugs that I do not want you to give to babies. Uh, babies who, as uh, Andy has told us, uh, can't abduct and externally rotate their shoulder when they're born because of a brachial plexus birth injury. And we have a variety of treatments for this, as Andy has gone over, uh, nerve surgeries, muscle surgeries, even bone surgeries that are pretty good at improving various aspects of shoulder function, such as abduction, external rotation. Uh, but then this also leads to contractures, such as the internal rotation contracture of the shoulder, which then leads to glenohumeral dysplasia, which makes sense because remember not in most cases, not all of the nerves are affected. And so the external rotators are denervated, whereas the internal rotators are innervated, leading to static, uh, to chronic internal rotation posturing and ultimately an internal rotation contracture. And of course, we've got a number of treatments for this, including uh, subscapularis release that, that Andy went over. And those are again, pretty good at improving active abduction and external rotation but what about internal rotation function? As Andy hinted at, there have been reports of severe loss of internal rotation function and up to all of the kids undergoing various aspects of uh, subscapularis release with or without tendon transfers. And so to address that, uh, a number of years ago, I adapted a technique from Evan Flato, an adult shoulder surgeon who noticed similar subscapularis deficiencies after total shoulder arthroplasty, where just cutting the top edge of the subscap tendon could release the subscap without completely detaching it, improving excursion uh, without uh, losing function of it. And so looking at the first few, uh, you know, 15 or so kids uh, showed that indeed, indeed improves passive external rotation uh, and improves a function of the shoulder without losing the hand to back or internal rotation function, which is the only measure we had at the time of internal rotation function. And so that's pretty awesome, except that it makes no sense because the only part of the tendon that you're cutting in that procedure is the part that's coming from the upper subscap muscle belly, which is innervated by the upper trunk and thus should be denervated, not working, whereas the rest of the muscle innervated by the lower subscapular nerve from the posterior cord should be working. So why would cutting only the denervated part of the muscle 
solve the contracture if it's the functioning muscles that are supposedly causing it, unless it's actually the denervated muscle that causes contractures. And so that makes us think about things in a little bit of a different way. So if we go back to our internal rotation contracture and blame that on the denervated upper subscap muscle belly, then surely we should have other contractures wherever else there's a denervated muscle. And indeed, the denervated abductors lead to glenohumeral abduction contracture, leading to the pudi sign or the, the slope of the scapula in attempts to adduct the arm to the side. Similarly, the scapular winging from in, internal rotation uh, because of an external rotation glenohumeral contracture. And then, of course, the elbow flexion contracture that follows elbow flexor paralysis. So everywhere there's a denervated muscle, there's a contracture. So we need to sort out how these denervated muscles could be causing the contractures. And so we developed a mouse model a number of years ago where various surgeries on the brachial plexus in a newborn mouse creates the appropriate paralysis leading to contractures within four weeks. And with this model, we were able to uh, address some important questions and answer some important questions. First, we found that the contractures are indeed caused by tightness of the denervated muscle. So the elbow flexion contracture that occurs following elbow flexor denervation could be completely relieved just by taking out the denervated muscles without doing anything to the joint capsule. So in, at least initially, it's a problem of tight muscle. And through a whole bunch of experiments, we found that there is muscle fibrosis there, which is, of course, what you think about when you think about muscle denervation, but it's not the cause of the contractures. And so instead, what we identified is that the contractures are associated with impaired longitudinal growth of these denervated muscles. And now muscles are made up of a, a series of sarcomeres all in a row. And if the muscle is shorter, it has fewer sarcomeres, but then you can just stretch those sarcomeres more to get to a given joint position. So if you control the joint position, and you see overstretched sarcomeres, you know that that muscle is too short. And so we've seen that in the upper subscap in the mouse. We've seen that in the, in the biceps and the brachialis in the mouse, but even in humans. So these are overstretched sarcomeres in human children's biceps in an elbow flexion contracture from a brachial plexus birth injury. But even cooler, you see the same thing in the contractures associated with cerebral palsy. So perhaps these two very different neurologic conditions are leading to a similar uh, a similar common pathway of contracture phenotype of what I'd like to call a myobrevopathy or a disorder of a short muscle. And, and if we can figure out how that is biologically regulated, and perhaps we could address that for, uh, pharmacologically instead of just letting the muscles get short and cutting them. And so fast forward through a whole bunch of biological research, we found that this impaired growth is associated with increased protein degradation in the muscle by the ubiquitin proteasome system, which is unimportant to understand other than the fact that if you pharmacologically inhibit the proteasome with a drug called bortezomib, you can completely restore longitudinal muscle growth and prevent contractures, representing the, the first ever pharmacologic approach to prevent contractures by addressing an underlying pathophysiologic mechanism. The trouble is, you need the proteasome in organs like the brain, otherwise you get Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, and so you can't give systemic proteasome inhibition. But we instead started to look at muscle-specific regulators of protein synthesis and degradation, such as myostatin, which is a normal suppressor of muscle growth. And you, you know that because when you have genetic deficiencies of this, this in this signaling pathway, you get massive muscle gain, such as in the Belgian blue cattle or the, the thighs of German track cyclist Robert Forstmann, Although on his YouTube channel, he just says he never skips leg day. Someone usually calls him out in the comment section, though, for being a mutant. And so we thought if we inhibit this, then we could perhaps restore muscle growth and prevent contractures. And indeed, that is the case, but only in female mice with no effect on the male mice, suggesting that the male and the female patients that we have with identical contractures are getting there through different pathophysiologic mechanism which is a little bit crazy, but we're working to sort that out. But we can say, based on this research, that contractures are indeed a problem of insufficient muscle length and that a biological cure is indeed possible one day. And in the meantime, we're left with what we really still consider palliative surgery. And, and we go to conferences such as this one in Barcelona last year, where you know programs feature distinguished gentlemen such as Kaiser Wilhelm II, who had a brachial plexus birth injury born in, I think, 1859 or so. And, and although that's kind of neat, it's also kind of sad because we've been dealing with this condition for over 150 years and even longer than that, and we still haven't solved the problem. And so when we go to these meetings, we go to flamenco clubs and we, 
we sit there and we bemoan the fact that we still don't have the answers to the problems. And it was one at one of these flamenco clubs that a few of us sat there and said, we need a completely different direction. And so that's when Andy Bauer and Dan Zlotolo and I founded this group called Plexus Nexus with a totally different approach, which was to first determine the moonshot goals, not how to incrementally improve uh, you know, surgical techniques and whatnot, but to really dramatically improve care of this condition and then create teams and networks to achieve those goals with some important rules, bringing questions, what we don't know, rather than answers, what we think we know, and leaving egos and our ulterior motives out of it. Uh, mo uh, uh, motivated by the Harry Truman quote, it's amazing what can get accomplished when it doesn't matter who gets the credit. And so we first met in Cincinnati in 2017, and we've had meetings almost every year since then. And these are working meetings where we get together and, and uh, address uh, question or bring up questions, sort out what the important questions are, and then develop teams. We started with a vision of until every child grows up without a brachial plexus birth injury, either because we've prevented them all or cured them all, with a mission to collaboratively improve the lives of people affected with the BVPI through prevention, treatment, education, research, and advocacy. And we've made some progress. First, we agreed on what to call it. So there are many, many different names for this condition, which makes it hard to find it in the literature, but we agreed to call it the brachial plexus birth injury. And on the education front, we have a website, although it uh, could use some improvement, there's some patient and clinical uh, clinician education there. And we've been working on developing a clinical practice guideline, not for us to agree on what to do, but for initial providers, what to do in that first four weeks, how to make it easier to find care. And then as far as research questions, we, we thought about all kinds of different approaches to answer questions that we all have. But as we addressed those, we had to we, we realized that we had to zoom out and actually ask, what are the outcome priorities that even matter, both in, ch in children and in adulthood? And so I'd like to highlight a couple of studies that have come out of that, um, uh, that perspective to help us answer that. And the first of which is the Guppy study, or Growing Up with a Plexus Injury, which is a prospective multi-center study led by Andy Bauer, uh, including Claire Mansky of Sacramento Shriners and Kristen uh, Davidge and Toronto Sick Kids, to ask two questions. First, how does BBPI affect global health, and what are the drivers of global health in these children? And so we first had to figure out what to measure, so using PROMISE global health as the overall health-related quality of life measure, and then for clinician measurements, so physical exam findings, we used Willem Pondog's uh, I Pluto or you know, international consensus on the physical exam measurements that we all feel are the most important. And then a variety of mostly patient, but some parent reported uh, outcome measures. And these are for patients eight years and older. Uh, so make, to make sure we were getting all of the four domains of the World Health Organization's ICF that Andy mentioned earlier. And we've recruited over 200 patients with complete data. And uh, although this is just interim analysis, what we are seeing is that there, there isn't really that much of a difference in global health between uh, our patients shown in the histogram and the normative population shown in the box and whisker plot here. But what's even more interesting is that we don't see any difference between those with an upper plexus injury and those with a global injury. In fact, some of the worst kids are kids with an upper trunk injury. So if if such a big difference as global versus upper trunk injury isn't affecting global health, then what is? And so we took, again, this is interim analysis, but we took all of the different uh, variables that we've been examining and correlated them against each other in this correlation matrix, where a big blue dot is a strong positive correlation and a big red dot is a strong negative correlation. And here are all the physical exam findings correlating with each other. And here's a whole bunch of physical exam findings not correlating at all with the patient reported outcome measures. And in fact, if you just look at the top line, the global health score, not a single one of the physical exam findings correlates with global health. The strongest negative predictors are pain. I'm not even talking about pain most of the time. And as far as positive predictors of global health, we have pediatric emotional functioning, but even more importantly, family relationships. So it's not motor function, it's not even the arm, it's not even the child, it's the family that is driving overall health-related quality of life in the children. So maybe we just need to wipe the slate clean and start all over. Like, how would we even approach this if we're, we're, if we're so far off? And one way to do that is ask the adults, right? What outcomes matter when you get into adulthood long-term? 
And unfortunately, that's not really very well known because the uh, impact of BVPI in adulthood is really, uh, as far as we know, is based on a few smaller studies that give conflicting uh, data regarding disability and quality of life, either because they're measuring small samples of regional populations or because they're measuring different outcomes that are chosen by different researchers. And so we took a different approach using the lived experience of adults with brachial plexus birth injury or LEAP study led by Jen Dorich, our lead hand therapist and a PhD researcher, as well as Jordan Whiting, a, a nurse uh, herself with a plexus injury who is also a board member of the UBPN and the, uh, the founder of an adults with BBPI Facebook group. And with this study, we first set out to identify the health-related quality of life concerns that matter to affected individuals using surveys and interviews, and then select patient-reported outcome measures to quantify those outcomes that matter to the individuals. And in the surveys, we used a mixed method survey with categorical and open-ended questions of overlapping concepts, concepts of health-related quality of life administered to two Facebook groups, a UBPN and then this adults with BBPI group. And we got 183 respondents from 21 to 87 years of age from all around the world. And not surprisingly, these, uh, these concept of, concepts of health-related quality of life were reported impacted by a majority of participants. But things got interesting in the qualitative data where hand and arm use wasn't just the affected extremity, it was by manual tasks and overuse of the unaffected extremity and quality of life was mostly emotional and social and overall health was mostly driven by pain and mental health. And so we dug a little bit deeper with interviews. So 12 participants, 26 to 80 years old, selected from maximum variation sampling of the survey respondents were interviewed and the data were qualitatively coded and themed. When, and three themes emerge. So first, that the experience is lifelong and variable, both over time and among individuals. Second, that BBPI impacts a wide array of biopsychosocial dimensions, and not just mental and physical, but also an identity and how one interacts with the world. And third, that opportunities were identified for improvement in terms of increased awareness, acknowledgement, and resources. And then we took all of the qualitative data and we brought it all together and, and took all of the meaningful concepts from the qualitative data and linked them to codes in the ICF so that we could calculate frequency distributions of these ICF codes at the domain and chapter level. And not surprisingly, the 402 meaningful concepts were distributed across all the ICF domains with body functions being the most important. However, things got really interesting at the chapter level where it was the mental functions chapter, the body functions chapter mental functions that was by far the most commonly represented chapter, followed by some environment and relationship chapters. And you had to go all the way down to the 14th most commonly represented chapter to get to the neuromuscular and movement related functions that we've been talking about all morning. So that's pretty interesting. So then we took all these ICF codes and we linked them to item banks and proms to develop this list of patient reported outcome measures that we sent back out to the, the individuals. And with 171 respondents from again around the world, we found that DASH scores were indeed worse than a general population and the PROMA scores were worse than a general population as well, although with mental health and pain worse than physical health. And then we thought, okay, well, we've, we have to figure out what's driving this. And so we took again, all of the different variables that we measured and correlated them with health related overall health-related quality of life and found that just about everything correlates. So we couldn't identify one specific thing to focus on, although the psychosocial concerns, again, had the strongest correlations. But instead, maybe we should zoom out and think about a meta variable, such as self-efficacy or temperament or outlook that's driving this overall uh, view of all of these different components of quality of life. And that brings up comments that we heard time and again in the interviews with these affected individuals that can be paraphrased as how your family approaches the injury in childhood determines how you approach it in adulthood. Sound familiar? This is exactly what the children are telling us too, that family relationships matter. And so maybe you're on this webinar because you're a surgeon, you're trying to learn how to do technically excellent surgery and you're thinking, well, this doesn't really apply to me, this doesn't really matter, but I would ask you to consider a case of a 30 year old male with a left brachial plexus birth injury and an elbow flexion contracture that he feels he needs to hide because of its deformity when in social situations. And he has a severely impaired relationship with his mother who herself is traumatized and grieving. And he has 
unresolved anger that can be uh, seen in the quote, an English doctor crippled my arm, which is the fault of my mother. And maybe, maybe if this family had received the support that it needed, maybe if we knew then what we know now, then this young man would not have grown up with the unresolved anger, the fractured family and the resulting psychological instability that have been widely attributed to lead directly to the genesis of World War I. So when we have our baby who can't abduct and externally rotate the shoulder, I challenge you to think about motion in all directions, to think about how the arm feels, to think about the biology of what's happening, but also think about the mind of the child and the family supporting them. Future directions to follow for sure. Thank you to everyone who did all of this research work. And again, thank you, Steve, and thank you, Andy, for uh, including me in this webinar. And hopefully we've uh, stimulated some questions to be asked. Excellent. Thank you both. Um, I see somebody has their hand up. If you could just put your question into the uh, Q&A box, that would be great. So I guess maybe I'll ask the first question. there that, that was touched on as far as mental health and, and support. Um, this seems like a, a, an issue that could go beyond just brachial plexus injuries as far as like in the nerve space. And, and is there any other literature that's out there that, that has found something similar in, in other areas outside of, of brachial plexus? Or do you see taking this concept and maybe then applying it uh, outside of the, I mean, I think the birth obviously adds complexity of family and, and other components, but um, I would think the the mental health is going to be a, a big impact in other areas as well. Yeah, certainly. I mean, Christy, who, of course, is a member of the GNF, has done a lot of work in the space in a traumatic brachial plexus injury uh, world. And that that is um, that's a, a traumatic loss of something you had. And so there's that uh, that loss aspect of it that's driving it. And, you know, but as Andy said, there's a there's a loss aspect of it. Right. When we don't call pregnancy expecting for no reason, right? There's an expectation right, that, that's there. And so when that expectation is not fulfilled or there's a loss there, then there's a grief associated with that that, that lasts for a long, long time. So um, I think it's it's really quite similar to really a lot of what we're seeing in, in musculoskeletal or nerve-related uh, injuries and problems that we need to approach it more holistically for sure. So we can all learn from each other in that regard. That makes a lot of sense. Um, just a reminder, I saw another hand go up. Please uh, feel free to, oh, there we go. Uh, so question from uh, a couple couple questions in the chat box. Do you investigate orthotic interventions that can be helped with these kinds of injuries when kids are young or too young to assist them uh, in, in movement? Yeah, so I think you know, both of us have, um, both of us believe in the role of stretching um, for those muscle contractures, certainly. And there's different ways that you can do that. The super splint was popularized in uh, British Columbia, which is an orthotic that holds the shoulder into supination and external, holds the form and supination, the shoulder and external rotation. Um, that hasn't taken off in my practice just because it's a little bit cumbersome, but I have used um, orthotics um, to stretch the elbow out, to stretch the wrist out, occasionally to stretch the shoulder out, but as an adjunct to stretching as we await for neurologic recovery in young kids. Agree. Yeah, and, and so it's a it's a double-edged sword. If you use orthotics to stretch or position, that can be very helpful, but it also discourages use. And another component we haven't really touched on is motor learning. So these young babies are learning how to use their limbs through trial and error. And if they don't try, they won't learn. And that process is delayed uh, after this injury. And so we really want to balance the, the use of orthotics um, in that regard. And, you know, the worst case scenario is someone whose sleeve is pinned to their their onesie for the first month of life because they may not, not recover function that they could have recovered. So just as a follow-up to orthotics, there's a question of use pre and post surgery. Um, are they, do they, 
both uh, they tend to be used in both situations. Yeah, so a good example of that would be the elbow flexion contracture. So we will use night splinting and then serial casting to achieve uh, elbow extension and the setting of an elbow flexion contracture, but then also to maintain it after if you know we have to do a surgical release to achieve uh, elbow extension. And then, of course, the same thing at the shoulder, if you're reducing a dislocated humeral head and and then maintaining it in an external rotated position to keep it in while you're awaiting that glenoid remodeling, because it's not inherently stable when you put it back in. And I think we'll follow along with the the, the orthotic count, uh, question in, in far as uh, what is the role of uh, physio pre and post operation? I mean, it's so important, and I think that's something that has to do a lot with um, resources in different countries. So in the U.S., where nothing is free, um, we run into a lot of problems with um, children's access to physical therapy. I think we have a lot of great expertise in the U.S., but it's not available to everyone. Um, and I think you can definitely see the difference Um as Roger said, these kids have never used their arm before. And so we need to encourage active use um, and motor development as the nerves are starting to come back online, whether that's from um, spontaneous recovery or postoperatively. And a skilled therapist who's able to elicit those movements and help the kid get stronger, I think 100% um, you know, is, a, is vital to their recovery. Um, I think you know one thing that we've tried to do is have the parents become as active as possible, like Roger was saying, and you know, inf involving the family. The family is such a big part of this. I think we probably um, need to keep working on making the parents good therapists, so that even if they don't have access, you know, if they live a couple hours mm -hmm. from me and they only get to see my therapist every couple months um, and don't have great local therapy, that they can, um, you know, be doing those things on their own, and the parents can become physical therapists. Yeah, and another to piggyback on that, you know, in terms of integrating therapy with surgery it's sometimes difficult to indicate surgery in people who have, quote, failed therapy, because if they've failed therapy because of lack of investment in it, then we know the surgery, with very rare exceptions, the surgery is going to fail as well. If they don't, if they don't uh, uh, yeah, buy into the therapy that's required postoperatively. So I think there are, you know, it's not one or the other, they have to work together. Steve, you're frozen. Um, um, we have, so here's a question cool about questions. pain. So I think these two we could kind of put together. Thanks, Roger. So here's a question about pain. Is it nerve pain or musculoskeletal pain or phantom pain? And that's a very, very good question. So to, um, yeah, it's actually really interesting. So we've got some other studies going on and, and Kristen Davidge has done a lot of work on this as well in Toronto, but there, there seems to be, a, there, there are both kinds of pain, but, but there seems to be an increase in pain as you get into adolescence, which implies that there's more likely a musculoskeletal component of it, tightness with growth and, and overuse, et cetera, that's leading to it as opposed to a, a neurogenic pain, which we do see sometimes in kids with avulsion injuries, a deafferentation pain, um, that uh, they would expect to be present uh, all along, but that's a much less common manifestation of the pain. What we don't know is once you get into adulthood, what, it, what that looks like, what is the pain? We know that pain is really important now, but we just haven't invested the same level of energy into investigating that. So that is a, that's a fabulous question. But interesting enough, Andy brought up that litigation study that we did. In, in the non-litigation cohort, the pain followed a very typical pattern of increasing into adolescence. And then the litigation cohort, the pain was really severe in infancy, and then it ended as soon as the uh, the lawsuit was settled. Apologize on the freezing front there. Um, there were two questions about the, and, and I think Dr. Barr, you touched on this a little bit about the diagnosing um, uh, or what is done to diagnose injuries, and then also how long to wait before corrective surgery? Yeah, so that's something um, that we've been working on um, at Children's with, along with the Shriners in Northern California and Gillette um, in Minneapolis, um, trialing a an MRI that would help us get information early. 
Um, we, our protocol is a non-sedated, non-contrast MRI, so no sedation, no IV. So we're able to do it really early, um, best at like two months of age. Um, we think we can see something there. Um, it's a work in progress, whether that's going to be something that's generalizable. Um, but I think the important the important thing is that uh, it's not been proven yet that an MRI will help you in your decision making. And really that clinical exam that I showed you, you know, that we've had for the last 20 years is still what I think everybody uses. Um, also, I think we didn't touch on is that EMG is also unreliable. So there are fetal innervation patterns. Um, there's ability of some nerve roots to take up the work of other nerve roots um, and EMG has, I think best been described as falsely optimistic where you might see something on an EMG that makes you happy, but does not turn into clinical improvement. And so aside from my physical exam, um, there's nothing that I've relied on. Um, although I'm very hopeful about the early MRI. Uh, and then typically I think I'm still using those same numbers, you know, operating on three months for um, younger, for global injuries and six or so months for upper trunk. Yeah, and and to to again pick it back on that, I think the, probably the most important investigation is the shoulder. So you know, if you're at six months or nine months and you and you're failing the cookie test, you need to sort out is that a muscle uh, or sorry, is that a a failure of nerve recovery and you know motor recovery or is it a bad shoulder? And so Cindy Vercher in British Columbia, who's trained with Howard Clark using just the cookie test, started paying a lot of attention to the shoulder, and her nerve surgery rate plummeted. As soon as she realized that most in her practice, most of the children that were failing the cookie test were doing so because of dislocated shoulders. And so if you have one imaging test to get on most, you know, on all of these kids, I would argue that an ultrasound of the shoulder, which should be widely available, if you have an ultrasound of the, the baby when the baby's in the womb, you should be able to get an ultrasound using the same machine of that baby's shoulder once they're out. So that's um that I think would would be something that that can really alter how the uh, the treatment goes. So we have a question from a, an OT that says pinning the sleeve continues to be practiced um, in their birth unit until the infant can see a, a pediatrician. How do you suggest we get this practice to change? Yeah, so that's exactly why we're tackling what we're doing with the, the clinical practice guideline in PlexisNexus. It's, it's meant to address any asymmetric movement of the upper limbs at birth for nurse midwives, obstetricians, neonatologists, pediatricians, you know, labor and delivery nurses, anyone who's going to see that child right away, what do you do? So, um, you know, how you evaluate, how you treat, how you educate, and how you refer. So that's um, that. And then that has to go, of course, through all the various uh, groups of pediatricians and and um, obstetricians and whatnot, and uh, and hopefully it will become something that's as widely uh, understood and utilized as the hip exam on every single newborn, so you can get a sense of whether or not there's some dysplasia. So there there's active work going on in that, but that is absolutely from from the parent's standpoint. Like I had no idea what was happening. Nobody said anything. You know, from the physician standpoint, I didn't know what to do. I'm afraid of litigation, so I'm just going to pretend it didn't happen. You know, from our standpoint, oh, I wish we had gotten to this sooner. I wish they hadn't done that. So that's it's really, you know, the that ground zero is is where we need to intervene. So thank you for that question. That's something that's really important. We had a question regarding uh, the difficulty uh, as far as parents' coping strategy. So when a child has an abnormality or a problem, um, you know, how do you approach the parents and how do you have that conversation about, about you know, their role and, and how it could impact the outcome moving forward? So I think, you know, so, and I, I peeked at the chat as well, and there, there are some questions about what sort of support do you provide? And this is, you know, we, we used to have a, in our center in Cincinnati, a, a social worker seeing every single family at every single visit. They that actually got cut back, which, you know, by the, the various powers that be when she retired. And that is a real loss, but we're trying to build that back. But I think these data are really just, you know, I mentioned interim analysis. These data are just coming out literally this year uh, about how important this is. And so once we 
fully understand this, then I think we need to really build resources at our own institutions and, and nationwide uh, or worldwide using this. But but I think the uh, one of the things that I've found the most important in, in my practice is, is admitting that we can't fix it as surgeons, but we can help and we can all work together and elevating, not, not placing extra responsibility on the family, but empowering the family to help the child in ways that they didn't think they could help the child. And, and having so much of this information coming from affected adults, it's not me saying it, it's your child 40 years from now reflecting back and saying, could you please you know, approach it this way? So it's it's really brand new information. I mean, it's not it's not a new concept, but it's brand new information in this space that we're still trying to address. So um, stay tuned. Yeah, I think that's something that everybody on this webinar can take back home. You can't all go out and hire a psychiatrist to join your practice, but today you can be honest when you see a patient with a brachial plexus birth injury. And I think that our, that's probably the biggest thing that we can do as surgeons. Like Roger said, admit the very first time you meet them that you, you know, commit to the prognosis and admit that you can't solve it all. And I think that goes a huge way to helping them through that grieving process and the, um, and the acceptance of the child's condition that then they can pass that acceptance on to their child. I think we might have time for uh, one more. And if your question wasn't answered in the from the chat, we'll try and, and have some follow up uh, as well. There's just so many outstanding questions. Um, uh, Dr. Pandag uh, had a question in, and it, it again kind of kind of touched on. But as far as bringing the socioeconomic component to things, and 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 how is that handled? And it complicates as far as uh, whether folks are compliant with uh, with follow up, and and is there any recommendations on how how you guys tackle that yeah I, i'd actually like to react first to the word compliance because if people are not compliant with follow-up we are not compliant with the context in which we're giving them their instructions right so we need to better understand how the socioeconomic space and how the you know social deprivation and how all of those challenges that the family those environmental factors impact how that family is able to interact with their child, interact with their healthcare providers, and interact with the diagnosis. So we need a lot more understanding of that, but it's not its not all just, you know, straightforward. Yeah, and I think one low-cost help, and hi, Willem, um, is um, that uh, at Children's, we've recently hired a patient navigator who's a layperson, uh, not, a, not a clinical social worker, um, and she acts, she calls herself the patient's personal assistant. And this is something where a family who's just overwhelmed and mom can't sit on the phone for half an hour to wait for my phone tree to cycle through to an appointment. She will say, okay, tell me what times are good for you. I'll get you in. Um, you know, you can't find the MRI scanner. I'll meet you in the parking garage and walk you there. Uh, you need a babysitter. Here's a list of organizations in your area. And she um, she just gets them help with whatever they need. And I think that's a low cost intervention to try to tackle some of those um, barriers. Excellent. Well, we are right at uh, 10 o'clock Eastern. Um, so thank you all for attending. Thank you to Dr. Cornwall and Dr. Bauer uh, for, for serving as speakers today. We obviously uh, still have some questions that we'll, we'll try to follow up with. We'll probably also be having some follow-up brachial plexus uh, events early in, in 24. So maybe some of these can, can be addressed there as well. But uh, can't can't thank you all enough for attending and, and, and to our speakers today. We'll send some uh, follow-up information and uh, hope everybody has a great rest of the year and uh, we'll see you in 24. Thank you. Excellent. Thank, thank you all. Bye-bye.